If you have a Bible, I would invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 this morning. Our actual sermon text is Exodus chapter 20, verse 22, all the way to Exodus 23, verse 19. 91 verses. But we'll be reading this morning uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, down to Exodus 21, verse 1. So that's what we'll read to begin our time together. Hear now the word of God. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear For God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And Yahweh said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. An altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make me an altar of stone... You shall not build it of hewn stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. And you shall not go up by, my, by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. Let's pray together. Father, we come this morning after having worked through the Ten Commandments to a section of Scripture that is not too familiar to most of us. That seems distant and obscure, and yet we know that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and so we pray that you would send your spirit to use your word to build us up in Christ-likeness. And we pray this with confidence in his name. Amen. Well, I need to begin this morning with a little bit of an apology. If you are here and you are fasting for whatever reason, I want to apologize to you in advance. This, my friends, is what is called the squeeze burger. (laughs) In high school, my friends and I discovered a burger joint in Sacramento called Squeeze In. Now, this was before you could jump online and go on Yelp or Google Reviews and find all sorts of new and exciting restaurants. But we had heard about a mythical burger place where their normal cheeseburger came with nothing less than a cheese skirt. They took a third a pound of ground beef, and a third a pound of cheddar cheese. And they would melt that cheese on the beef, creating a crispy skirt of griddled cheese. And then they would take that lovely amalgamation of beef and cheese and put it on a bun for the sole purposes of your gastronomical enjoyment and cholesterol. Now, here's the question. What in the world does the squeeze burger have to do with this section of Exodus? Right? <laughs> Exodus 23:19b. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Kosher Jews believe that this verse and others like it 
prohibit the mixture of meat and dairy. So when Pastor Westcott went to Israel, he was not able to get cheese on his hamburger. He could order a hamburger. And in other settings, he could buy cheese. But he was not allowed to have cheese on his hamburger. He could have cheese on his fish sandwich, but there were definitely no squeeze burgers allowed. So squeeze filet fish sure. Or squeeze impossible vegan burgers, sure. But a cheeseburger, absolutely not. Now, what's the main point of our passage this morning? Is the main point of our passage this morning that when you go to McDonald's after church, that you should not order a cheeseburger? <laughs> All of you were like, oh, I sure hope not. Because <laughs> after seeing that picture, I know where your minds were. No, that's not the point of this section of the book of Exodus. We know that these rules are no longer binding on us as Christians. But there is something that we can learn from this section. And this is the main point that I want to leave with you this morning. That God calls his people to obey and glorify him in every facet and every detail of their lives. Okay? God is so mind-blowingly holy and awesome that he deserves to be obeyed and glorified, not in a few small compartments of our lives, not merely on a certain day of the week, but God deserves to be glorified and obeyed in every facet and every detail of our lives down to what we eat and drink and how we do it. Okay? That's... That's our main point this morning. Now, today is the first Sunday of what Westcott and I have been calling the back half of the book of Exodus. And what you'll find as we move through this part of Exodus is that for the most part, we're going to be taking larger sections of Exodus over the next few weeks and months. So just as I didn't read all 91 verses of our passage this morning, so I'm also not going to explain all 91 verses of our passage this morning. You should read all 91 verses, and perhaps that's a good, some good homework for you this week. But, but I'm not going to do that this morning. Rather, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw four key themes from these 91 verses to help you understand what's going on here in a deeper level. And I want to center those four themes on God. Okay? So our first point is this. What we see in this passage is that first, God knows the sinful hearts of his people and the sinful state of their world. God knows the sinful hearts of his people and the sinful state of their world. Here's the question we need to answer this morning as we begin. What necessitates all of these laws, right? Some of which seem very obscure to us. And we can answer that question in two ways. The first thing that necessitates these laws is the sinful state of the world. The sinful state of the world. So so take, for example, the first portion of Exodus chapter 21. Right, this section is entirely about slavery. Okay? It's talking about laws that would govern and regulate slavery and slaves and their owners. Now, we need to be careful here because this is not the race-based shadow slavery that mars the history of our nation. Right? But... While it's not that extreme, the fact that any type of slavery existed at all for Israel tells us that their world was not as it ought to have been. This, the slavery that was practiced in Israel overwhelmingly ro- arose due to three main factors, okay? War, famine, and tied to that, 
poverty, okay? And all of those things, war, famine, and poverty, those things were not part of God's original creation, were they? Right? The nation of Israel, as Moses is giving these laws to them, lives in a world that is marred by it, it's twisted by it, it's corrupted by sin and suffering. And on one hand, these laws then are meant to help the nation of Israel navigate life in a fallen, sin-filled world. Let me give you an example. So in Exodus 21, 7, we read this. When a man sells his daughter as a slave. Okay, and immediately, we're just taken aback, right? Right? We're like, how could a father do that? But what we need to be careful not to do is not to read this as an instance of a heartless father just trying to get rid of his daughter in order to make a profit. Because that's not what's going on here. What is going on here is you have a family unit that has been devastated by probably by famine and drought and therefore is impoverished. And so this father selling off his daughter, right, is actually his only path of seeking to give her a better life. This is not a heartless father. This is a loving father. But the fact that this is even a possibility is a reminder that Israel, even when they are living in the promised land, will not be exempt from things like poverty and famine and drought because they live in a fallen world, okay? The second thing that necessitates these laws is the insidious temptation that resides in every human heart to find loopholes, the insidious temptation that resides in every human heart to find loopholes. If, if we were to break down all 91 verses of this passage, we would begin to see a pretty clear pattern that some of, that all of these laws and rules listed here, you can take a, a pen and draw a fairly straight line from any of these laws and commands back to one of the Ten Commandments. Okay, let me give you a, a few examples of this. Okay, so Exodus 21, 15. Whoever strikes his father or mother shall be put to death. Which of the Ten Commandments does that tie back to? Right, honor your father and mother, right? Or Exodus 21, 29. If an ox has been accustomed to gore in the past and its owner has been warred and has not kept it in, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and its owner shall be put to death. What of the, which of the Ten Commandments does that tie back to? Well, it ties back to you shall not murder. Okay? Exodus 22, 5. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over or lets his beast, lets his beast loose and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best in his own field and in his own vineyard. What does that tie back to? You shall not steal. Exodus twenty two twenty. Whoever sacrifices to any god other than Yahweh alone shall be devoted to destruction. This ties back to you shall have no other gods before me. Right? And this actually, this technique actually helps us to interpret some of the stranger laws in this section. So that law that I started with, Exodus 23, 19b, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Most likely, that very obscure law tie, ties back to you shall have no other gods before me. Because historians tell us that, that one of the practices among ancient fertility cults in Canaan was that they would boil a young goat in its mother's milk as an act of worship to the Canaanite gods and goddesses of fertility. And so Israel was not to mimic them. But my point is this. Why couldn't God have just given the people the Ten Commandments and stopped there? <laughs> 
Why couldn't he have just given those to them? And they would have known his heart and what he desired and then followed them. Well, because the natural inclination of every human heart is to find loopholes, isn't it? Well, you know, God said, you shall not commit adultery, but I'm not married, and she's not married, so technically, this doesn't count as adultery. Or, well, God said, you shall have no other gods before me, but what about other gods next to him? <laughs> right? Like, I can worship Yahweh and Baal equally, right? And the fact of the matter is, that is the inclination of the human heart. Friends, in a group this size, I'm certain that there is at least one person in this room right now who is either on the cusp of or in the midst of sinning in a grievous way against God. And that person is probably doing all sorts of mental gymnastics right now to justify jumping into that sin headfirst or remaining in that sin. And I want to say to you this morning, stop. The most fearful thing in the world for a professing Christian should be when he sins and no longer feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Right? When he sins, but he never experiences the hard but loving discipline of God the Father. Why is that a fearful thing? Here's what we read earlier this morning. Hebrews 12, 6, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. If you are on the cusp or are in the midst of unrepentant sin and you have not felt convicted by the Holy Spirit, and you have not felt the hard but loving discipline of God, you have not experienced the chastisement of your heavenly Father, then you should be terrified. But if you are on the cusp or in the midst of sin right now. And as I speak, you are feeling convicted and you are feeling disciplined and called out and chastised, then you should rejoice and you should not quench the Holy Spirit any longer, but turn from your sin today and stop trying to justify it and stop trying to find loopholes and find in Christ the gracious forgiveness that is found because of the cross. See, God knows our sinful hearts, doesn't he? He knows our proclivity, our expertise in finding all sorts of loopholes, doesn't he? To find workarounds, to justify our temptations, to find excuses for our sin. And so in the midst of all of this, he calls us to be holy as he is holy, and he gives us these laws in very specific ways so that we can no longer find those loopholes. What we see in these verses is nothing less than the kindness and graciousness of our God, who knows that we are a fallen people living in a fallen world. It's the first thing we learn about God from this passage. The second thing we learn about God from this passage is that God cares for the weak, the helpless, and the downtrodden. God cares for the weak, the helpless, and the downtrodden. We could probably distill the Ten Commandments down into to two commandments, right? We talked about this last Sunday. Love God and love others, or love God and love your neighbor. And the same could be true of the, the 91 verses that, that are in our passage this morning. We could distill them down to how we relate to God and how we relate to one another or to others, but one of the things that's fascinating, if you read through this section of Scripture, 
is the types of people that are explicitly mentioned in these 91 verses. Let me give you a list of the types of people that are highlighted here. Slaves, women, the physically handicapped, pregnant women, unborn babies, virgins who have been seduced, sojourners or foreigners, widows, the fatherless, and the poor. I mean, look at that list, right? This is not the who's who of the nation of Israel, is it? Right? This is a list of the people most likely to be taken advantage of, right? Most likely to be left impoverished and remain in their poverty for generations by their circumstances. These are the people that were most likely to be oppressed by other Israelites, most likely to be ignored, most likely to not receive a fair trial in court. And in verse after verse after verse, God tells his people, the commandments I am giving you, I am charging you to obey these commands, not merely in relationship with those who are like you, who share your economic status, who share your social status, who have the same rights and privileges that you have. No, you are to obey these commandments, especially in relationship to those who are unlike you, to those who are lower on the social ladder than you are, to those who have less than you, to those who, aside from my intervention, have little or no rights or privileges in the world. Why? Because God cares about the weak and the helpless and the downtrodden. Psalm 68, verses 4 and 5. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. Verse 5, father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. Why are those two categories of people chosen? Because they were the most vulnerable in the nation of Israel. Or, or listen to the song of Hannah, 1 Samuel 2, 7 and 8. The Lord makes the poor and takes the poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. Listen to this, verse 8. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and, he, and on them he has set the world. Friends, this is the heart of God. Now let's look at two examples of this and then I want to apply this. We read in Exodus 22, verse 16, if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give her the bride price for her and make her his wife. What's going on here? Okay, here's the situation. A man takes advantage of a woman and he seduces her. And if this happens... And afterwards, he just walks away from her. The likelihood of her ever getting married to someone else is slim to none. Why? Because she's no longer a virgin. So what she can do, what she would have done, is she would have lived with her, her father and her mother for the rest of her life. But what happens when her father gets old and passes away? Guess who his inheritance doesn't go to? Her. Guess who her in his inheritance does go to? Her brothers. And if she doesn't have any brothers, to the next closest male relative. She gets nothing. She's left destitute. So this law is put into place to ensure that she would be provided for. Some jerk just can't take advantage of her and then get off scot-free. This law protects one of the most vulnerable members of Israelite society. Uh, or look at Exodus 23, 10 through 11. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield. Verse 11. But the seventh year 
you shall let it rest and lie follow. That, purpose clause, that the poor of your people may eat. And what they leave, the beast of the field may eat. You shall likewise do with your vineyard and your olive orchard. So this command is rooted in the command to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, but it's applied in a yearly sense. But how is it used practically? It's used to bless. So while the rest of the nation is remembering the Sabbath in yearly terms and keeping it holy, guess who is allowed to harvest? What does it say? The poor. This is Israel's welfare system. And we should note that while this speaks of a seven-year cycle, so six years of reaping and sowing, and then a seventh year of letting the land rest, that also worked into Israel's law was the fact that the edges of all their fields were to be left for the poor and the sojourner. And what they gleaned, if, if it fell to the ground, they were to leave that for the poor and the sojourner. We see that in the book of Ruth, right? So it's not just that the poor were provided for every seven years, but every single year they were provided for. And on the seventh year, they had a buffet. <laughs> That's what they had. And it's not just the poor, right? Even the beasts of the field are provided for. The point is this. This law was put into place to bless, to provide for, and to sustain the poorest of poor in the nation of Israel. Why, church? Because that is God's heart, right? God cares for the weak. God cares for the helpless. God cares for the downtrodden. So I ask you this morning, are any of you here today and you feel weak? Are any of you here this morning and you feel utterly hopeless? Are any of you here this morning and you feel like the world has beaten you up and taken everything from you and you are at the end of your rope? You feel that way this morning? Am I describing you? Then let me speak to you for just a moment. Look up, friend. Look up. Look to the God we have been describing. Look to the God who is the father of the fatherless, who is the defender of the widow, who raises the poor from their lowly estate, who takes the weak and the frail of the world and prepares for them a seat at his table who takes those who have nothing on this earth and crowns their heads with loving kindness. Listen to how God describes how he will shepherd his people in Ezekiel 34. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. And the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Dear friends, the God who meticulously laid down these laws for his people to follow so that they might treat the weak and the helpless and the downtrodden among them with extra dignity and extra care and extra provision and extra generosity is the same God who invites you to come to him today and find all that you need. Are you tired? Go to him for rest. Are you weak? Go to him for strength. Are you poor? Go to him. He is your treasure. Are you guilty? Go to him for justification. Are you lonely? Go to him for relationship. Are you sad? Go to him for joy. Are you hurting? Go to him for healing. Go to the God who cares desperately for the weak and the poor and the helpless and the downtrodden.
one more thing I want to say before moving on. And I want to speak to us as a church. Church, of all the people in our nation, do you know who should care most about the weak and the helpless and the downtrodden, not only in our churches, but in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our communities, and in our country? We should. <laughs> we should care about those who have mental and physical disabilities. We should care about those who are steeped in poverty. We should care about refugees and immigrants. We should care about the homeless. We should care about those who have been victims of prejudice and hate crimes. And dare I say it, instances, true instances of police brutality. We should care about unborn babies in the womb, and we should care about single mothers that are having to raise them. We should care about the elderly in our nation. We may not have all the solutions to all the factors that lead to the types of situations that these people find themselves in, but God has not called us to have all the solutions, church. He has, however, called us to reflect his heart, the compassionate heart of God who cares about the weak, the helpless, the downtrodden, the marginalized, and the impoverished. We need to receive that this morning, church. Third, third thing we see in this chapter, or these chapters, that God demands to be worshipped and he demands to be worshipped on his own terms. That God demands to be worshipped and he demands to be worshipped on his own terms. If the commands in these 92, 91 verses can be divided up, right, we'll see that they're divided up into two categories. How we relate to others, which we've talked about, and how we relate to God. And as we look about at the commands that relate to how we relate to God, we see that God demands to be worshipped on his own terms. Okay, he is God, we are not. And he gets to decide how people come to him in worship. We see this all over the place. Let's look at Exodus 20, 24, and 25. I read this to start our time this Morning, an altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings. Verse 25, if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. So what is God saying there? God is saying to the people that, that they are to build him a simple altar for their sacrifices. Right? To build them an, an altar of earth. Right? And if they are going to make him a more permanent altar, it cannot be an altar of hewn stones. It cannot be stones that have been shaped and fashioned by a tool. Why? Right? Why wouldn't God want a nicer, more permanent, a fancier altar? Well, the most likely reason is that the simplicity of the altar wouldn't become an object of worship itself for the people, okay? It was not about the ornateness or the size of the altar, but it was about God who demands exclusive worship and God who demands to be worshipped on his own terms, down to the very types of altars they were to use. Or look at Exodus 23, verse 13. Here we read this. Pay attention to all that I have said to you and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. It's not just that God's people were to not to worship other gods and goddesses, but they were to not even say their names. I remember having a non-Christian friend in college once ask me to pray for him. And I knew that he was an atheist. And so I asked him, why? And he said, well, I just want to have all my bases covered. 
okay. Right? You can imagine the appeal, right? Well, I'll pray to Yahweh, but just in case, I'll throw in a few Canaanite gods and maybe even a few Egyptian gods for good measure. What does God say to that? Nope. Right? God demands that he and he alone be worshipped. And he demands that he be worshipped on his terms. Even, even another one of these strange commands, Exodus 23, verse 18, we read this. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened or that the fat of my feast remain until morning. Now, we can dabble in all sorts of speculations as to what in the world God's talking about here, right? Why could they not mix their blood sacrifices, animal sacrifices, with their sacrifices of bread, Right? And why, why could the fat of the animal that was sacrificed not remain until morning? Well, there's probably echoes of Passover instructions in this verse. But here's the bottom line. God gets to choose how he is worshipped. The people don't get to choose the terms. Friends, this is why we are so incredibly careful about what happens when we gather for corporate worship. <laughs> because God gets to choose the terms of how he's worshipped. And that's why we seek to make the Bible central to all we do. It's not fancy, friends. We read the Bible. We pray the Bible. We sing the Bible. We preach the Bible. Now, I'm not sure what the Bible says about taking selfies on stage with graduates, <laughs> but we'll let that one slide for the time being. Here's why we do what we do. Because when we make the Bible central and primary, it keeps us from coming to God in our own imaginative, creative ways about how we think God should be worshipped. No, 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 church, we don't get to decide how we think God should be worshipped. He gets to decide that. And that's not only true when we gather corporately, that's true in our own individual lives as well. God gets to set the terms of how he is worshipped. Fourth, and finally, here's where I want to end. And Pastor Westcott alluded to this two weeks ago, but I think it bears repeating. The fourth thing we learn about God, that God condescends to and pursues his people through a mediator. When we hear that word condescend, we almost instinctively think of it in a negative light, don't we? But in earlier uses of that word, it, it merely spoke of this idea of someone coming down to another person's level. Here's, a, here's maybe an image that will help. Imagine that there's this brilliant Nobel Prize winning scientist. And imagine that that scientist is patiently and lovingly explaining how clouds are formed to her curious four-year-old son. <laughs> That's what God does. <laughs> he condescends. See, something actually shifts in the start of our passage. We just finished the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were spoken directly from God to the people, including Moses. And yet at the end of those Ten Commandments, the people had had enough. So in Exodus 20, verses 18b and 19, we read this. The people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off, verse 19, and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us lest we die. And that's where our passage starts. The people are, draw, are drawing away from God and Moses moves toward God. It goes up the mountain. And in the next verse, verse 22, Exodus 20, 22, we read this. And Yahweh said to Moses. So he's not talking to all the people. He's talking to Moses. And then we get our 91 verses of basically case laws applying the Ten Commandments. And then in Exodus 24, verse 3, we read this. Then Moses came and told the people 
all the words of Yahweh and all the rules. So God speaks to them through Moses. Now think of the contrast that has been painted here. On one hand, you have a God who is terrifyingly holy. And the people recognize that. Right? That's why they're drawing away from God. You have a God who is mighty and terrifying and awe-inspiring and fearsome. Just, just quick pause right here. When was the last time you trembled in God's presence because you recognize his majestic holiness? Okay? So on, that, on one hand, you have this God who is terrifying and fearsome and awe-inspiring. And then you also have that same God who is graciously, patiently, compassionately, understandingly, and tenderly coming to speak to his people on their level through a mediator, right? Through his servant Moses. Friends, here's my question as we end this morning. How much more has God done that for us in Christ, right? God condescends to and pursues us by taking on human flesh, right? By being born in the likeness of a fragile human being. Jesus, the Son of God, truly God, and yet truly man, comes to serve, not to be served. And he comes to give up his life as a ransom for his people. God comes to us. God condescends to us. God gets down on our level. And God pursues us in his infinite love, in his infinite grace, in his infinite compassion, in his infinite tenderness, and his, in his infinite humility. As the book of Hebrews begins, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets through mediators but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son God has spoken to us by his son he has come to us in his son he has given us a perfect mediator the mediator Jesus Christ 1 Timothy 2 5 and 6 for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Friends, this mediator has kept all of these laws perfectly. And he's imputed his righteous law-keeping perfection to us so that we can be reconciled to God. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even in some of the most obscure passages of Scripture, we see your glory and we are reminded of our mediator. God, I pray that you would help us as your people to live every aspect of our lives, glorifying and obeying you. And yet, oh God, when we fail in doing so, we give you praise that we have a perfect mediator that, that stands between us and between you the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.